All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for um, joining us tonight for the second virtual edition of the MIFA Public Lecture. My name is Katie Sauer. I'm the administrator for the Minnesota Institute for Astrophysics. Um, before we get started, there's just a couple of house housekeeping items I'd like to go over. Uh, first of all, uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the whole presentation for Dr. Kelly. Um, please use the Q&A function that's located at the bottom of the screen. Then once the presentation's over, uh, we will answer as many questions as time permits. And then also we are recording this webinar. And then afterwards, within like a week or so, we will be sending out a link to all the registrants so that you can share it with your family and friends. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Evan Skillman, who is the director of MIFA. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, as many of you know, we also run the Kaufmanis lecture series and it was during one of those lectures that I thought, my goodness, we have a lot of good stories here at Minnesota to share. And so we created this uh, public lecture, if you will, the MIFA public lecture. And we've highlighted a number of our faculty. Tonight, we're highlighting one of our youngest faculty. Pat has been with us for just four years now. It was is in his fourth year, I should say. and. Uh, uh, we're, we're very happy to have him. He has a, a great background. He grew up in Washington, D.C., and he went to school, the same school that Bill Nye, the science guy, went to. Uh, then he moved on to Harvard for his undergraduate years, Stanford for his Ph.D., and UC Berkeley for his postdoctoral time. And at UC Berkeley, he worked with Alex Filipenko, who uh, almost 20 years ago now, I think, gave a Kaufmannus lecture here, which was a very exciting Thing for him to do. So for all of us, in, in fact. So uh, without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Pat and let him talk to us about bending of light. Class is presenting a little bit of an obstacle when you Trying to get these face masks off. <laughs> well, thanks. Thank you, Katie, for organizing this and Evan for the very nice introduction. Um, go ahead and get the microphone on. All right. So, um, started here. So my, my name is, is uh, Patrick Kelly, and uh, I'm um, very excited to talk about my research that I've uh, been working on in Minnesota the last several years. And um, today, what I'm gonna discuss is uh, galaxy clusters. And galaxy clusters are the most massive gravitationally bound structures in the universe. So they contain an enormous amount of matter and they act to and the path of light rays passing by them. And in so doing, they act as lenses. Um, and as lenses, they can both uh, multiply image background sources and magnify those background sources, allowing them to be used as uh, very powerful magnifying glasses to study the distant universe. And so I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of my favorite galaxy clusters here. Uh, and th this image you're looking at below shows uh, a foreground, part of a foreground galaxy cluster. Uh, you can figure out which uh, <clears throat> galaxies are in the cluster from their color. So the yellow ones there are the uh, cluster members. And so there can be thousands of galaxies in a galaxy cluster. Uh, and the, the blue spiral, what we would call a spiral galaxy, is a background magnified galaxy. So it, it appears four times brighter uh, in, in many regions than it would if the galaxy cluster weren't there. And we also see two images of it in this snippet um, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. So uh, this galaxy cluster, sort of like a hall of mirrors, it creates multiple images of background galaxies and magnifies them. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit first about the history of gravitational lensing and um, and then talk about my research, which involves what happens when something explodes in one of these background galaxies. So uh, Isaac Newton, who was really you know, one of the, you know, the originators of physics as we know it, 
had, you know, he, he was in, interested in many different topics. Uh, and one of them was what we now call gravitational lensing. And he thought about this question, do not bodies act upon light at a distance and by their action bend its rays? And is not this action strongest at the least distance? Well, that's a good question. So it was more of a question at that, at that point. Uh, was he, he didn't have a way or it wasn't able to, to um, test this, um, you know, this, this hypothesis that in fact, matter could bend the path of uh, light passing near it. But he, he, he posed this question. And um, within the framework of Newtonian physics, uh, Cavendish in the late 18th century worked out, in fact, uh, you know, how much of a deflection one might expect if there were a mass close to the line of sight to a background object. So you can see the observer here in the foreground is uh, looking outwards and there's a, a, a source which emits a photon and that travels past this lens. And as it passes by this lens, its path is deflected by an angle. And so Cavendish calculated what this would be if Newton's theory of gravity uh, was correct. And so that, that's this formula here. So you can see two times the gravitational constant, big G times the mass of the lens over the, di the closest distance at which the photon approaches the lens over uh, and divided by the, uh, the square of the speed of light. All right, so um, this hadn't been tested. Einstein uh, was putting together his own theory of gravity, uh, which we now know as general relativity. Uh, and uh, this took him a while to uh, develop after he had developed uh, his first theory, the, uh, the special theory of relativity. Um, and at first he, he realized this was an interesting uh, possible test of his theory, you know, how much uh, are, are photons deflected. And so at first he, uh, he made a computation, a calculation using uh, only the gravitational time, di time dilation. So as um, say a photon travels through a gravitational field, uh, it's, it's time will, will pass, appear to pass more slowly. So Einstein uh, then realized a few years later that uh, he had neglected to in include the effect of curvature of space. And after he did that, his prediction became uh, twice as large as the prediction from the Newtonian, um, uh, the, the Newtonian uh, framework. So this provided a, uh, a great opportunity to test for the first time uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. And so the, the eminent uh, astronomer, Sir Arthur Eddington, um, launched a couple of expeditions. I think uh, the, uh, this effort to, 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 to test general relativity was delayed a little by the uh, First World War, but he eventually was able to um, carry this out during a solar eclipse. And um, so what he was looking for was a, the apparent deflection of stars near the sun uh, during the solar eclipse. The solar eclipse, the moon would block the light from the sun, allow, allowing him to see, uh, or his team members to see the, the stars that are uh, on the other side and they're having, and whether their positions shifted as the, um, the sun uh, came close to them. And so his measurement of the deflection angle, in fact, uh, confirmed Einstein's prediction. And so this was a, a a terrific beginning for gravitational lensing. Now, uh, if we go back to this old, the, this picture here, uh, you know, the a background source rays can be bent around the lens. Now imagine that uh, those rays could actually travel around both sides of the lens. Well, that would give you multiple images of that background object. So you would see it not once, but say two times or three times or four times or five times. So you can see that in this diagram. Um, and so Einstein and others realized this potentially could happen, but you'd have to have uh, such a, if you had say a star, a foreground star and a background star, you'd have to have a very good alignment. And uh, the, the general thought even from Einstein himself was that, you know, there was really no hope of observing this phenomenon. And um, as an observational science, gravitational lensing sort of fell into a, a backwater, but observers didn't give up. Um, so this is Fritz Zwicky here, who is this, uh, kind of iconoclastic uh, astronomer. And he, uh, he not only actually was uh, made contributions to gravitational lensing, which, uh, but he also in fact coined the, 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 uh, the word supernova. 
Um, so supermarket and, and, and words like that became popular in the 30s and 40s and so. So we'll talk about supernovae too in a bit. But anyway, he, he realized that um, galaxies and galaxy clusters would be terrific in principle gravitational lenses because they have such enormous masses. So let's, uh, let's look a little bit more and try to understand gravitational lensing. Um, so if you have a perfect alignment between Earth here on the left and uh, a background galaxy on the right, upper right, and then you have your lens, so a galaxy or galaxy cluster in the middle, everything's perfectly aligned, uh, you will see a, what's called an Einstein ring. And so we do see these in fact. And so this is a, an image of a background blue galaxy that um, appears as a, as a ring around a foreground um, massive older galaxy. So you can see here uh, what happens instead if the symmetry is broken a little bit. So you, you don't have a perfect alignment or the, the lens is not perfectly spherical. So it breaks up from this nice perfect Einstein ring into a bunch of arcs. So there, and here we go. That's, that's what we see if we look at in, the, in the right place in the sky. So what, what is very spectacular is when you have a galaxy cluster and there uh, you generally don't uh, lens a single background galaxy, but you can actually see many, many galaxies at once. And so you're looking here at an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of many of these arcs uh, and they're all magnified and they provide a terrific opportunity to study those galaxies as well as the matter in the clusters. And most of that matter is actually dark. We don't see it. We don't actually know quite what it's made out of. And so uh, by studying the distortion of these background sources and their positions, we can actually provide a powerful constraint on dark matter. So, uh, so here's just another visualization to wrap your mind around this idea of gravitational lensing. And, uh, and so the cluster itself will um, deflect rays and create uh, these large tangential arcs, uh, background galaxies. And you in fact may have a gravitational lens or at least an analog very nearby. Um, so you can, you know, after the talk, uh, try this out, but if the, you have the foot of a wine glass is actually very similar to a gravitational lens. So instead of a, you know, matter doing the work, instead of you're, you're having glass uh, in the foot of the wine glass, but you can, if you have a perfectly uh, alignment with a background, say a candle, you get a nice Einstein ring. And then if you tilt it, break the symmetry, you start getting a bunch of different arcs. So if you have an iPhone, you can also do this with pictures. And so uh, this is, I don't know if this is a uh, Instagram filter yet or not, but uh, you can download this. I think it's called Grav Lens. On a, and so you can gravitationally lens yourself if you want. Um, all right. I, uh, okay, so, so that's kind of fun. Um, so what happened after, after 1919? Well, um, not much. Uh, so people thought there wasn't much of a chance of observing gravitational lensing. Uh, there was some work in the solar system bouncing radar signals off other planets, um, but uh, no multiple images, no high magnification. And so in fact, it was in the late seventies that uh, some astronomers using a telescope Kitt Peak near Tucson found um, a very bright pair of quasar images. And so uh, you know, these, the light from these quasars traveled to us for about 10 billion years and um, this foreground gravitational lens. So there's a, this big you know, ye yellowish galaxy in the middle creates two bright images of it. So that was the first discovery. And um, it wasn't until 10 years later that people started finding these uh, really dramatic arcs that I showed before. And this is one of the most famous ones here. Um, and the image on the left is what you can see from the ground with a fairly large telescope. The one on the right is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, the Hubble is really the advent of the Hubble Space Telescope that revolutionized gravitational lensing. And the reason for that is both the exceptional resolution, angular resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope, but also the fact that the background is not very high in space. You don't, it's not, um, not a lot of scattered light. Uh, and so that uh, allows you to pick out these very faint arcs. And you can see in the picture on the right that you can find many of these. Um, so that's that's the background of gravitational lensing. Um, 
theorists, brave theorists are, uh, are always welcome. They have, you know, fun ideas. And, and, um, and one of these theorists was Sir Refstall. So in the, in the 1960s, 1964, he wrote a paper where he imagined uh, a supernova exploding in a multiple image galaxy. And he realized that this could actually be a very useful phenomenon. Um, if you could measure the time delay and the arrival of the supernova in say four images, uh, you could use that delay among the, the arrival of those images to constrain the expansion rate of the universe or the Hubble, or Hubble's constant. Um, and uh, so we'll talk more about this, but this has motivated a search beginning in 1964 for such a multiple image supernova. Um, just to give you some idea of how this works, and don't worry about the details here very much, but you can, uh, if you have say two images of a supernova, and you measure a time delay uh, between them, you can measure the, essentially the distance, uh, the difference in the, dis uh, the sides of two of those triangles, and you have the angles on the sky. Uh, and from that, you can actually establish a geometric distance across a significant fraction of the universe. And so that provides a, um, a direct, geometric distance scale for the universe, uh, which you can combine then with the uh, uh, recessional velocity or the redshift of objects to constrain the, the Hubble constant. So it's, uh, so the prediction was made in 1964 by Sir Restall that, you know, we could, we should look for, for one of these. Unfortunately, it took about, took well, 50 years to find one. And uh, I was lucky enough to find it. Um, I find the first example where we could actually see multiple images of the supernova. And essentially we saw reruns of it, not once, but actually five times um, and predicted that it would reappear in a fifth, uh, a fifth image after we'd seen the first four. So we'll talk more about that. Um, here we see the, the full field. Um, uh, this is a, a galaxy cluster known as Max 1149. And so there are three images of this galaxy and we're seeing the galaxy at, at slightly different periods of time since it takes the light different amounts of time to reach us. So we think that in the, um, in the 90s, uh, the supernova would have appeared in this image to the upper left. We didn't see it, the Hubble Space Telescope wasn't looking there at the time. Um, and it was in, in November of 2014 uh, when I was analyzing observations with, taken with Hubble that I spotted these four points here, which were new. They weren't seen there before. And, uh, and that was the arrival of four images of the supernova. So the galaxy cluster creates these uh, three images of the host galaxy of the supernova. And it turns out that there was happened to be a member of the galaxy cluster. So that's the yellow galaxy there in, in uh, in between the four images of the supernova that actually additionally creates, multiplies the um, image of the supernova four more times. So it's kind of a double gravitational lensing phenomenon, uh, but we predicted that it would reappear final time closest to the center of the galaxy cluster. And one very interesting thing is that in fact, this path through the center of the galaxy cluster, you might say, um, would take the, the shortest amount of time. So that should, uh, the supernova should arrive first in the, in the center. In fact, it's the last one. And the reason for that is that the photons have to travel through the gravitational uh, field of the galaxy cluster, which um, curves the space in the middle of the galaxy cluster and, and causes gravitational time dilation. So we're seeing at, in a very direct sense, the effect of gravity. Uh, by the fact that the supernova appears last on the most direct route through the galaxy cluster. So, so here we go, let's go back to November of 2014. The supernova had appeared in this, what's called an Einstein cross. So if you see four images of the supernova, those yellow dots. And um, we we're able to predict using lensing models that it should reappear about eight arc seconds away, if you're say an amateur astronomer, you know what that means, uh, in this final image. And um, so we can, here's just another visualization. So the, the light first traveled um, along this peripheral path to the upper left. And that was the, turns out to be the fastest path to us on earth. The second one was uh, through this, uh, the Einstein cross on the lower right. And then the final path was through the middle. And that was the slowest. All right, so here we are. Uh, 
So there's a whole modeling community, people who try to understand how matter is distributed in galaxy clusters because we wanna understand what the dark matter is. We don't understand what the dark matter is even though it makes up the vast majority of the matter in the universe as well as in uh, galaxy clusters. And so uh, we try to understand how it's distributed in galaxy clusters and constrain its distribution to understand you know, how is, what is dark matter made out of. If it's made of particular kinds of particles, it may be distributed in a different way. So um, modelers really were very, very excited about this uh, possibility of making a prediction for when the supernova would reappear. And why is that? Well, that's because um, there are very few opportunities to make a, a falsifiable prediction. This is Karl Popper's idea in, in uh, astronomy, especially outside of our, our Milky Way. Um, so it gave an opportunity for maybe about 10 different teams to say, you know, we're, we have the best prediction, we have the best models of galaxy clusters, and you know, we're, we're, we say it's going to show up on December 1st, uh, 2015. And, and if they were right, then it was quite possible that their um, models for the distribution of dark matter in galaxy clusters were probably more, more accurate. So I just want to give you some idea here of, of some of the diversity among these um, mass maps or models of the distribution of the dark matter in this galaxy cluster. So here's one by Adi Zitrin, and he kind of assumes that the dark matter more or less follows the luminous matter you can see. So the stars, the, the, glowing, the glowing stars you can see by eye. And then here's another model by Karen Sharon. You can see it's you know, quite different in many ways. Um, so if one has a more accurate prediction, this provides some insight into the models. And um, so here's a plot showing these predictions. So detected, found the supernova in November of 2014, so in the fall of 2014. And um, so the community made their predictions uh, using their models. And so you can see all these different colors correspond to different model predictions. Here's December 1st. And so you can see looking at this plot, there's days on the, the, the horizontal axis here that basically all the models predicted that the supernova should reappear in the summer or the fall of 2015. So I organized or proposed a uh, monitoring campaign with the Hubble Space Telescope to look for this reappearance. And there were some astronomers out there who said, uh, you know, really, you're never going to find it, and no one's going to give you time to look for it. Um, I mean, this was in, you know, in the newspaper and stuff. Uh, and so fortunately, we, we were able to get enough time to monitor every month the field uh, and, uh, and, and look for the reappearance. And so that's what we did. And um, the first visit, so the field, so this cluster is behind the sun, too close to the sun a good part of the year. So it's kind of hidden from our view, but it comes back out in October. So our first, we kind of expected, given the, all the predictions, that it basically it should, should be there by the summer or the fall that we would see it when it came back out from behind the sun. And as you can see here, there's no, no supernova in the, the empty dot there or empty circle. Um, and so we had to keep waiting. And I was getting a little nervous because uh, there were, you know, there were certainly people out there who thought the cluster models were really off. Um, fortunately, in December, lo and behold, there was a, a dot where it was supposed to be. So we were seeing the arrival of the supernova um, a little later than expected. So here's a very uh, a deeper image. You can really see that the, the supernova supernova has has reappeared. Um, and so not only does the timing of the reappearance depend on the models to some extent, but it also depends on the expansion rate of the universe, as Refstall himself uh, explained or derived. And um, and so he uh, and so. If a later arrival, in fact, would imply that the universe is expanding perhaps more slowly if you had the right model for the galaxy cluster. Um, so keep that in mind. So from the first couple of measurements of the reappearance, we're able to put some approximate constraints on when the supernova actually reappeared. And so, uh, so the, the, this banana here kind of shows what our first measurements were. Um, the magnification ratio in the other direction shows you sort of how bright the reappearance would be compared to the original appearance in the, uh, the Einstein cross. So that's, that was our first measurement there. Um, 
And since that time, we put a lot of effort into measuring this time delay as precisely as we can. Um, we actually have measured the, the delay within 1.5%, which is so very precise. And why are we putting so much work into this? Well, the reason was that uh, we'd like to, we want to, uh, we wanted to make a very precise, as precise measurement we could of the Hubble constant. And so the Hubble constant, it turns out in the last few years has become a very hot topic in astronomy. Um, and I'll explain why, but first let me just give you a quick primer on the Hubble constant, um, the expansion of the universe. So here is this famous raisin bread, um, which you may have seen before. So if you're baking raisin bread, um, you have a bunch of raisins spread out in your dough. As it bakes, it will expand. So uh, it turns out this is very much like the expansion of the universe. So if you look, say, at this uh, raisin that's closest to uh, the five, you know, five centimeters away from the, the central raisin here, um, you can see after the loaf has expanded, it's 10 centimeters away. Now, look at the, uh, the 10 centimeter away one, now it's 20 centimeters away. So the, the raisins that are twice as far away are actually also moving twice as fast away from us. And so this is what um, Edwin Hubble uh, in the late 20s uh, was able to establish and so uh, <clears throat> called Hubble's law and Hubble's constant relates uh, the, the velocity at which galaxies are moving away from us from their to their distance uh, from us. And so he was able to measure this, uh, this constant and make a first estimate for it in the 1920s. So today, uh, his, uh, there are a, a bunch of astronomers who have continued his tradition uh, and sort of used an expansion or an extension of his method to measure the Hubble constant. And so they've measured this, the Hubble constant using what's called the distance ladder, uh, where you calibrate certain kinds of star called Cepheid variable stars. And then you can use those to calibrate type 1a supernovae luminosities. And then you measure more distant type 1a luminosities and distances, and you can figure out how fast they're moving away from us from the Doppler shift or redshift, uh, and from those two quantities, figure out how rapidly the universe is expanding. So they have really worked very hard to come up with as precise a measurement as they can. Um, meanwhile, a separate team have used the uh, cosmic microwave background. So this is radiation uh, that was produced uh, or was able to start moving through the universe uh, without being scattered or, or absorbed. Uh, about or several hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, and since then has um, has uh, has been able to freely propagate until it uh, ran into one of our detectors. And from very um, sensitive measurements of the cosmic microwave background, they've been able to come up with a separate and independent measurement of the Hubble constant. So here you can see a plot of these two different estimates. So you can see the CMB or cosmic microwave background is in red, is in black. Um, and so back in, in 2004, they essentially agreed with this other, um, the Cepheid team, um, which is the local distance ladder, one of the local distance ladder estimates that I, I described earlier. And so they more or less agreed, but as time has, has gone on, you can see that the, the cosmic microwave background estimate has started to really diverge from the, the Cepheid measurement. Uh, meanwhile, that is a separate local distance ladder estimate that's been made using a different method called TRGB, um, but it's not quite as precise as the Cepheid measurement yet. So in any case, there seems to be a, a very strong tension between these two measurements. And this is, I would say, one of the more exciting, most exciting topics in uh, cosmology today, since it's really difficult to explain in a, in a simple way. Um, other measurements of cosmological measurements don't find any evidence for um, departures from our, I guess, paradigm, uh, which we've developed to explain everything. And so this would be the sort of a crack in the wall. And so there's been a lot of interest in whether or not this is actually a true difference, or perhaps there's a, a systematic error of some kind that's affecting one or the other. Uh, and in fact, if we could correct for that, they would agree with each other. And so given this tension, we really want another independent measurement uh, that has nothing to do with either one. And it turns out that, you know, Refstall 
could provide one of those. And so that's, that's why we're so excited about it. And so with this very precise time delay we've measured, um, we're able to place a constraint on the, uh, on the Hubble constant within 5%. Um, and I, I can't share what the value is and which, which side we uh, agree with more or, or not, or if we fall in the middle, uh, because um, the, our paper is still under review. But, uh, but in any case, it's, uh, it's, we put a lot of work into it. And, um, and then we're you know, very excited to carry out this original experiment that was dreamt up in uh, 1964 um, for the first time. So here's the light curve of supernova Refstall. So the light curve is how a supernova brightens and then fades with time. So you can see um, the top set of points here, those are the data we've collected for all five light curves of the supernova. And we've shifted them, given our, the measure of the time delay and put the points on top of each other. So we have this very, you know, a huge number of measurements of this uh, supernova. And it turns out that it's very similar to supernova 1987A which uh, exploded in the Large Magellanic Cloud in 1987 and uh, is the most nearby supernova in the last couple hundred years. It also turns out to be a little bit of a, a weirdo supernova um, explosion of a blue supergiant uh, massive star. So these, are, these stars are more compact and hotter than your typical supernova progenitor. But nonetheless, uh, this seems to be the kind of um, star that exploded and gave us uh, supernova ref stall. All right, so to kind of wrap up, um, discuss the discussion of the, the supernova that we found, it's the first multiple image supernova um, that we were able to find with, with resolved images. So we've seen five images now of the, the supernova as reruns. Um, and this is the first time we've also been able to predict the appearance of a supernova in a particular place and time on the sky. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, and we're using it now to, um, to measure the expansion rate of the universe, the Hubble constant, to address this controversy about uh, whether or not there's a disagreement between the local distance ladder and, uh, and the value estimated from the cosmic microwave background. So this may tell us about exotic physics, if, if we really need to, to reconcile those two. All right, so along the way, I wanna tell you about another very exciting discovery. So here is, again, two images of uh, the, host, the, science, the host galaxy of supernova Restal, the galaxy where the supernova exploded. And you may notice that these are actually mirror images of each other. So it's the same galaxy, but they're flipped. And they're flipped across what's called the critical curve. And the critical curve is very, is a special place um, because it's where the magnification is greatest. So formally magnification actually would become infinite there if you had a very small background object, say like a star. Uh, and, so, um, and so it's a very special place. And you know that near this critical curve, the magnification from the galaxy cluster reaches its maximum. So keep that in mind here. All right, so here we are, here's the field. Again, this is in 2011. Um, so no supernova yet. All right, so uh, here we go. The supernova has now reappeared in this image. And see if you can spot something else that's changed here. So it's probably not too hard to see, but there is a, uh, a source right here that's, that's brightened, that was, that was not there before. And it turns out that is an individual star seen uh, over more than half the, the, the size of the universe. So the light from this star is in the same galaxy, of course, has traveled to us for, for 10 billion years. And that star is 200 times more distant than the next most distant star we can study. So this gravitational lens has allowed us to see an individual star um, across most of the universe. So here's, the, here's a picture of the star again in, in color. Um, and uh, so you can see it's very close to this so-called critical curve. Here again is a light curve and uh, showing how the brightness of the uh, star changed with time. And you can see um, that it you know, reached a peak. So we found it in, in May of, of 2016 and it continued to brighten for, for quite a while and then faded away. All right, so, uh, so what about the star? Well, we were able to look at some very deep data from the Hubble Space Telescope and 
look at its colors uh, and uh, also figure out how magnified it was. And I'll explain why its brightness changes in a second, but first about the star, it's, uh, we found that its, its light curve was unlike that of a supernova explosion or some other kind of stellar explosion. Um, instead, we think it was due to something called microlensing. Um, and we found that it was a blue supergiant. In fact, very similar to, to Refstall's stellar progenitor. So we're seeing evidence for two blue supergiants in the same galaxy, which is intriguing since blue supergiants are often, are comparatively rare. Um, and so there's, you know, Rig Rigel you may know is a, a famous nearby blue supergiant. So here's, here's the colors of the, uh, of the star that we found, which we called Icarus. So flying too close to the sun, um, coming very highly magnified briefly. Um, and, uh, and so you can see that it has this jump here called the, which is called the Balmer discontinuity. And this is something you, you don't see in stellar eruptions. Like, you know, stars can explode a supernovae. Uh, you know, famously there's a, a star called Eta Carr that has these episodic, um, uh, undergoes episodic mass loss and temporarily brightens. Um, and you don't see this, this kind of a spectrum for uh, an eruption like that, um, but it is something that matches our understanding of what are called you know, blue supergiants. So this is a star we think has a temperature of around 11,000 Kelvin. Um, and, uh, and so we weren't able to get a very detailed picture of its spectrum, but the, the red points here show the, amount, the brightness of the star and, di and different, at different wavelengths. And that matches our models of a blue supergiant. So it's a very luminous star. All right, so the star, as you saw and at the beginning, actually brightened. And why did it brighten? Well, what we think happened was that an individual star in the foreground galaxy cluster moved into the right place and sent essentially more light towards Earth. So this is something we call a microlensing event. So you've got you know, a galaxy cluster, gravitational lensing and deflects the light a lot. You have a, a smaller lens, micro lens, say just an individual star um, or perhaps a neutron star or black hole, it will, can deflect the light a smaller amount but still create a significant amount of magnification. And so we think that a, a star in the galaxy cluster moved into the right place temporarily and, and caused the um, star to brighten by basically a factor of two or three. So it's magnification jumped from maybe 600 to 2000 temporarily, allowing us to find it. And the fact that, it's, uh, that it became brighter actually uh, provides evidence that it is intrinsically very small, in fact, the size of a star. If it were much larger, then it couldn't experience what's called microlensing and, and its, its flux couldn't vary. So the fact that it, it brightened and faded quickly tells us that it's extremely compact, so the size of a star. All right, so we kept watching the field and lo and behold, we found another event, um, which we called Iapix. We're getting into our Greek, uh, Greek mythology. Um, and uh, we think that is a, probably a mirror image of the same star, uh, which is usually in fact hidden perhaps because of a, an object that instead of sending light towards us, sends light away from us. But if another object moved in the right place could potentially um, brighten temporarily. And so, um, and so we, we, we see these mirror images of the star. So you expect in general, if there were no microlenses to see mirror images of the star, much as we see mirror images of the galaxy. All right, so you, you can imagine you know, hiding on one side of this critical curve, an object, and in fact, on the side of the critical curve where the object appeared to be hidden, um, it's actually ex expected to be easier to hide objects over there just due to uh, the configuration of how, or sort of how the microlensing works. All right, so if you have, for example, a black hole, you can see in this plot, uh, you know, that there are regions of low magnification. So those would be the darker regions. And so if you had a, a black hole or a, um, perhaps more likely a star or a, or a neutron star, you could uh, temporarily align it, temporarily come aligned and hide the, what's called the counter image or the mirror image um, of the star. All right, so I'm gonna show you a video, which hopefully will make some of this clear. Um, 
And uh, so what we're gonna watch here is, oops. So this is a video made by a collaborator of mine in Spain. And what he's done is to simulate um, what happens. And so <clears throat> you have a galaxy cluster in, in front of a background galaxy and we're looking at an individual star in that background galaxy. Now, everything in this is moving relative to everything else. So the, the galaxy cluster is moving relative to the earth and the background galaxy is moving relative to the cluster at about a thousand kilometers per second. And so um, all, each one of these dark points here corresponds to a different object in the galaxy cluster act, that can act as a micro lens, um, deflect the light of the background object. And so the screen of micro lenses is going to move relative to the background star. So the star then traverses across all those objects. And you can see in the bottom, the magnification uh, that the star receives. If there were no magnification, no, no micro lenses at all, you just have a flat magnification that wouldn't change. If you add these micro lenses, then um, as the star moves in the right place in alignment with a, a background object, I mean, sorry, a, an object in the, in the cluster, then the magnification go, go up or down. So this is very interesting. It provides a direct uh, way to probe these tiny objects that are floating around in the galaxy cluster. And not only do we see one of them, but we can see evidence for many of them. So we can now start to um, try to take a census of what's in galaxy clusters. Uh, we're not just looking at the light, we can actually see things that are dark. So in, intrinsically dark, like neutron stars and black holes, uh, we can you know, see how many there are in galaxy clusters, which can tell us about how massive stars evolve. And since when, when they die, they can either become a neutron star or a black hole. Um, and the experts still don't entirely understand why um, you would end up as a black hole versus a neutron star. And so by taking a census of these objects in the galaxy cluster, we can um, provide insight into that. And um, as I said before, galaxy clusters are mainly made of dark matter. And we don't know what dark matter is. One possibility is that some fraction of dark matter could be composed of um, black holes that were formed uh, just after the Big Bang. And so these are called primordial black holes. So what if you replace 1% of the dark matter, you're looking, peering through, through galaxy clusters with these primordial black holes. Well, then you can see immediately that, um, that uh, you get very different magnification or quite different magnification patterns. And so the, you can see here, instead of seeing this one image at all times of the, the star, you can actually see the, the black holes have the effect of making you know, multiple images at different positions at one time, since they can, each of them deflects light more than say an individual star could. So if you're able to peer very high resolution, we can't see this, this is very high resolution, then you would see many different small images of this background star appear and then, and then be destroyed. So um, anyway, th this is uh, a lot of fun. And, um, and we're hoping by, by monitoring the, the star to put constraints on how many of these primordial black holes could be floating around in the galaxy cluster. All right, so um, and I just also wanna highlight a, a discovery um, that postdoc Wenlei Chen and with the other collaborators in Minnesota, like uh, Lilia Williams made. And so we had found this first example of a highly magnified star uh, and uh, thought, well, maybe we've been missing a number of other of these in observations over the last several years. And in fact, uh, we were able to find by looking at data that other people had taken, but they, or they had missed actually these transients. And we went back and did a very careful search. We found another blue supergiant um, in a different galaxy cluster. Uh, so you can see that these arrows pointing here. There are a couple other transients uh, or um, objects that brightened and faded in a different arc um, that Steve Rodney found. And so we named, but we named this object we found here at Minnesota um, Warhol since after this, phrase attributed to Warhol, you may not have actually said it, but in the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. Uh, and so the idea is that if, as a star experiences microlensing event, it becomes very bright and famous to at least some astronomers and now I guess you too. So, uh, so there was a writer for the, the Daily who put together this Warhol inspired graphic. Um, all right, so in that case, we can always see two images of the star, the, the mirrored images of them. 
Uh, and you can see they're very close to each other. So it really tests Hubble's ability to distinguish between them. But uh, if you model it carefully, you can definitely see there are two images there. Um, so this, this uh, discovery along the way of uh, while we were trying to measure the Hubble constant with uh, supernova Refstall has actually opened an entirely new window into what, what galaxy clusters are made out of. Um, are there primordial black holes floating around there uh, that were made just after the Big Bang? Uh, and then, you know, how, how many uh, massive black holes are there versus neutron stars? Um, and maybe how many low mass stars there are? These are questions that are basically impossible to address uh, in distant galaxy clusters in any other way. And finally, the stars themselves that are highly magnified are very interesting. Um, as I said, they're hundreds of times farther away than the next most distant stars we can study, which are really in nearby galaxies. And so the gigantic magnifications of you know, thousands um, provided by the foreground galaxy cluster lenses are uh, incredibly powerful and, and they you know, extend the, uh, or amplify the power of Hubble a huge amount. You, know, you, you couldn't build a telescope powerful enough. Um, to match uh, the magnifying power of these lenses. So Hubble has been around now for, well, I guess, let's see, almost 29 years. Um, well, I, wait, sorry, <laughs> do my math, okay, 30 years. Uh, we have to apply for what, cycle 29, the Hubble Space Telescope, so which threw me for a loop there, but I guess they didn't get started right away with uh, taking data. Um, so uh, the successor is the James Webb Space Telescope, and that is going to launch from French Guyana, uh, hopefully, I think around October uh, of this year, that's the plan. Um, and it's had some hiccups along the way, but I think the latest one is that the, the, the planners were worried about pirates intercepting the telescope on the way to French Guyana. Um, so you have it, I'm not, I, I didn't read the, the news article, so I'm, I'm going, uh, so I, but in any case, the, you know, if you have a $10 billion instrument, you don't want it to be stolen by pirates. Um, all right, so, so James Webb uh, plus galaxy cluster lenses will allow us to see extremely faint stars and perhaps even the first generation of stars. Um, I've worked with some collaborators to examine that possibility. And uh, it seems as if it's possible that we could find these extremely metal poor stars. So they're not enriched by supernova explosion since they're the first stars. Um, so they're called population three stars and it's possible that James Webb could directly see these um, given help from galaxy cluster lenses. Um, so that's you know, very exciting uh, on the horizon here coming up. And right now uh, working on a, or I'm leading a program called, which we, we called flashlights. And often astronomers have these somewhat tortuous uh, acronyms and so for this project, I just abandoned that and gave up on calling it, uh, or this is not an acronym, it's just flashlights, but uh, we're, we're using the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but instead of taking images with filters in front of the camera, like you can have a red or blue green filter, we've thrown those out and we're just um, basically trying to collect as many photons as we can at once and observe each of these fields for basically a day at a time and without looking at anything else. So we're just focusing on each of these clusters for a day and then coming back a year later and, and uh, taking imaging for a day. And so this turns out to be five times deeper than any existing observation of galaxy clusters. And um, we're just getting our return visit to look for these you know, changes and are finding a lot of exciting things. And so um, here's the group at Minnesota that, uh, or part of the group that, that, that's working on this project and we're having a lot of fun. So um, yeah, and so with that, I thank, thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to uh, give the talk here. And uh, yeah, are there, are there questions? <laughs> okay, so uh, do we have some questions in yeah. the, we have some already here, okay. Let me turn this down. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna start at the top with a question from Daniel. It says, so if there is dark matter around distant galaxies, is there dark matter around our galaxy, the Milky Way? 
If so, is there dark matter within our solar system? So yeah, the answer is yes, yes. Uh, there, there is uh, certainly, um, we don't think our, our galaxy is any different from any of the other galaxies out there. And in fact, you can, um, by looking at how stars in our, our galaxy move, we can infer that there's, in fact, must be a lot of dark matter that we're not seeing directly. And then here's uh, a very simple question is, what is Z? You used Z on some of your graphics, ah, yes. and Good I think question. you didn't Good explain question. it. Well, it, it tells you essentially how redshifted the light that you measure appears. So if you have an object, it, it tells you indirectly sort of how much the universe has expanded since the light was emitted. So as the universe expands, it stretches uh, light and causes it to have a longer wavelength. We can measure that. And so Z is a shorthand essentially for how much um, that the light has expanded as it's traveled to us. Next question is from Dave and says, do you know of any visual observations of gravitationally lensed arcs, such as that in Abel 370? Oh, you mean without, like without a, uh, maybe without a, a detector, just by eye. That, uh, I think, I think that's the question probably, but yeah, I think, um, I mean, certainly I think uh, amateur astronomers can see I mean, the, uh, it sounds like this is maybe an amateur astronomer. So the, the, the lens quasar, the twin quasars that it showed um, at the beginning, those are actually 17th magnitude. So you could um, certainly see that with a, a telescope in your back. Well, and if you had a good telescope, <laughs> maybe you could see that. Uh, and um, in, in terms of the arcs, I, I'm not sure that uh, you probably, I think you need a big telescope for that. Yeah. Okay. So, so the next question is, is um, it's I, a little bit longer, so you have to stay with me. So all right, to keep it in a Minnesota reference, this is from Daniel. If I were up in the Boundary Waters in August and lying on my back near a campfire, watching the sky and focusing on a star, and it suddenly and I saw, it suddenly saw it expand greatly, I think, or gets brighter, I would assume I was watching a supernova that might have happened millions of years ago. So are you saying that I might come back to the same spot several years later and observe the same supernova because of the bending of light? Uh, that, yeah, that's, it's possible that uh, you could see um, supernova basically have a rerun uh, and if it were multiple image, I think it would be hard to, um, that, I mean, it would be difficult to see, see it with the naked eye if you're on the boundary. I mean, if you brought a big telescope with you to on your canoe trip then you could <laughs> you could do that but yeah uh certainly um yeah yeah i think it would be hard it would be you, you need to you need the lens at the right distance and enough mass to create these multiple images and so it might be hard to do uh in a way you could see it uh, by eye but um if you had a telescope so you're saying if it was close enough to be able to see by eye the probability that there'd be a massive cluster between us and it would be pretty low at that point yeah, you could only really see it if it were in our galaxy or maybe a nearby galaxy by eye. And so there's no, no galaxy cluster in, you know, in the right place. The next from Kevin, are there many blue supergiants in the current universe? Were they more common seven and a half billion years ago? That's a great question. Uh, and uh, really, we, we can't, well, first of all, they're not uh, as common as red supergiants, which are um, you know, the way many, many massive stars, you know, end their lives. Uh, but we, I mean, there is a significant fraction. And I think if you go to metal, to galaxies that don't have as many metals in them, there are more blue supergiants in the nearby universe. We don't really know about what happens at higher edge because we can't see, or in the, in the early universe, because we can't see individual stars. And so um, the fact that we have now seen evidence for a bunch of these is, is very exciting. Um, with actually with the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, we'll be able to see red supergiants as well that are highly magnified more easily. Whereas right now Hubble is very good at finding these blue supergiants. And so once we have GWST and Hubble, we'll be able to essentially take a census, qualitative census of how many blue supergiants and red supergiants there are you know, billions of years ago. So Andrew, asks, you indicated that light from a distant source might bend around a massive object, such as a galaxy cluster, before arriving at Earth for us to see. Assuming there was more than one object between the light source and the observer, 
Would the light appear to bend multiple times? If so, how could you compensate for that in observations and calculations? Thanks. That's also a great question. Uh, and in fact, we had to do exactly that for, um, for Restall. So you can see in this image here that uh, there's a, a galaxy in the middle of the uh, Einstein crust, the set of four images of the supernova. And so if that weren't there, we'd only see one image of the supernova there. So in fact, this was deflected both by the galaxy cluster and the galaxy in the galaxy cluster, sort of a double, the double gravitational lens system you're, you're uh, proposing here. And so we've had to do exactly that, uh, tackle that exact problem. And uh, basically you, you just model the, the galaxy and you model the galaxy cluster um, and add their effects together. The next one, uh, the next question, I think they're trying to trick you into saying what you didn't want to say. It says, did you find that the Hubble constant is a constant? <laughs> well, that was very clever. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I, I can't, I, I can't comment. I guess. <laughs> but uh, it's certainly interesting. I think well, but it's, it's but you can tell us, when do you expect, so you have a paper that's submitted at this point? Yeah, it's under review. So. And so when do you expect that that might uh, appear in press then? Uh, well, it's not, it's still, we're still waiting for our first referee report at, the, at this point, but um, yeah. And, and we're, we also have two papers together, the one with the time delay and one with the Hubble constant measurement. And so they have to come out at the same time. And so, but, so it might be a, a few months. Well, maybe you could just describe the process of, of refereeing, you know, how long does it normally take? Oh, okay. And, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So it, it uh, well, in fact, the interesting story here that I was at the meeting of the American Astronomical Society and virtually and uh, and gave a talk about this work without revealing the answer. And then the editor of, of a fairly famous journal said, you know, please submit this to our journal. And so that's what that's what we did. And so uh, we, we and so usually what you do is you you send your paper in and then they send it to a couple referees, anonymous referees, and then they um, and provide comments and decide you know, if there are anything that need to be corrected or problems with your analysis, or if not, they'll recommend it for um, publication or to be accepted. And usually you can go through a couple rounds with the, the referees um, before it's accepted and then it will be, become public and shared with everybody. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gregory, you mentioned primordial black holes as a candidate for dark matter. How strong a candidate is this theory currently when compared to other theories? Oh, well, these are really good questions. Uh, so yeah, it's in, uh, primordial black holes have kind of come back into vogue uh, after the detection of large population of black holes by, um, by LIGO, so the, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory through the gravitational waves. Uh, and so people became excited about the possibility they could account for some fraction of dark matter. Um, it's been ruled out probably uh, for various different masses of primordial black holes, but there's still windows where it's possible they could account for all of, all of dark matter. Uh, at the same time, it's possible that some fraction of dark matter could be formed by black holes. Um, so there are theories of physics of the early universe, which suggests you could form you know, some density of these, which we could potentially still detect today. So. Okay. Uh, the next question is, so can gravitational lensing cause false positives, i.e. repeated or refracted images that are multiples of the original? Well, right, so, uh, so if you had no, no gravitational lens and you're looking at a supernova, you'd see it once. Uh, and so um, gravitational lenses, uh, lens, lenses can essentially multiply the number of images you see and make them brighter. Uh, and so each image you see is really the light from that source. And so they're all, you're seeing photons that were emitted by that supernova just redirected towards us. Uh, and so that, in that sense, they're not false positive, they're uh, legitimate images. Um, but in a sense, they are also a, uh, uh, I mean, in a bit, of, in a sense, an illusion, because it looks like the, the source is where it's not actually, right? If you were to go in the direction towards the supernova, it wouldn't actually, you wouldn't ever reach the actual explosion. You'd have to redirect the way the light was directed. Um, and so in that sense, it's, it's a bit of an illusion, but uh, you do see legitimate images uh, multiple times. I think they were also maybe thinking about the fact that you have multiple images of galaxies 
uh, in, on the surface of a cluster. And so if you were in the business of counting galaxies, you would overcount the galaxies, right? If you counted them, if you didn't recognize that they were multiple images of the same galaxy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So that you know, usually if, if something is magnified by at least a factor of four, then you start getting a multiple images of them. But and actually, it's an interesting. That's an interesting point because uh, many of the very distant infrared sources we see are actually gravitationally lensed. I mean, and uh, they look like they're very bright, but in fact, they're highly magnified. So it's a problem. Yeah, we don't, I guess it's just nomenclature. We don't call them false positives, but it's certainly a, a, a lot of room for confusion in there if they're not identified properly, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so a question from Brian. In the picture of the Einstein cross, do we know which of the four images of the supernova is the actual position of it? Oh, that's a good question. No, so actually none of them is, right? So if you took the galaxy cluster out of the way, then the, uh, the supernova, I think, well, that's a good question. I think it would be, you know, close to the center of the, where this close to the center of the galaxy cluster is. And so if you followed the lines of sight to any of those, you'd go in the wrong direction. You'd, and uh, it's the action of the cluster to redirect the light that um, places them where they are. And, uh, and so none of them is in the correct position. Actually. Oh, and there's a follow up. And how do we know that? <laughs> How do we know that? That's a good question. Um, well, uh, I mean, it, it basically, uh, we have a very good handle on how these gravitational lenses work, right? We can model them so precisely. So I, I showed this graphic here. Um, so the model is on the right and the, the Hubble image is on the left. And so we really can figure out how these work. And so the fact that we can see, we can reproduce exactly how they work tells us we're not, we're not fooling ourselves. And uh, we know that there's no, you know, we know that they're all deflected and the images form at different positions from where they would if the lens weren't there. And I think I would add to that, that um, in this case of an Einstein cross where you have the four different uh, images, uh, maybe someone would say you're confused with, you know, a random or coincidental juxtaposition of different objects, but you have spectra of each one of those four objects in the spectra all identical, meaning it had to come, that light had to come from the same source, right? Yeah, and their uh, light curves are the same. And it, yeah, the time variation, yeah, yeah just with the delay. Okay. Oh, keep going. Uh, another question from Daniel. Can these observations be made from ground-based telescopes? How dependent are we on the continued availability of the Hubble Space Telescope? Yeah, that's another good question. I think there was a contingent of uh, the astronomical community that uh, maybe the director, I don't know, used to call them Hubble huggers or something like that. So I must be one of those because I, I like Hubble a lot. But yeah, it's a, the, the operators will always you know, tell you if you're using Hubble that it's getting to be an old telescope. Um, I mean, and so uh, anyway, to answer your question, um, in fact, we think the, that we should find thousands of these multiple image supernovae using what's called the Legacy Survey of Space and Time at the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is being constructed in, um, in Chile. And so uh, it has such a wide field of view from the ground that um, it should cover so much of the sky and I think the whole sky every three nights that we should be able to find many, many of these. Um, and so the trick will be fine, you know, identifying which ones are actually multiple image supernovae among the many things that go bump in the night, but um, we should find many of them. In fact, you know, and, and one has already been found from the ground um, after, after we found rest of all. So there's a, there's a great future, including, we're not completely dependent upon Hubble. Yeah, but you really want Hubble though. You, you really, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you want it. You're not gonna get these beautiful images, uh, you know, picking out you know, without, without, without Hubble. So it really is very powerful. But JWST should, should do some of the same things. And uh, the Roman Space Telescope is supposed to launch in 2025. Okay, here, so this is a sort of a follow-up from Brian. If I may, if that's the case that none of the images in the Einstein cross is the real one, how did you predict exactly where the image of the supernova would reappear uh, time shifted? That's a good question. Well, yeah, so there's no, I mean, I think first of all, there's no idea of a, there's no real image, right? Since they're all, they're all, you know, legitimate images. Um, but uh, 
we can essentially figure out where you can actually see this. Um, so if there, you can see that the, the supernova expanded, uh, exploded in the spiral arm of this galaxy. So you can actually map each of these blue little knots over to another, the same blue little knot on the other mirror flip side of the image. So you can, if you can see that, uh, they're just flip images of each other. And we know um, on the right, the lower right, where the supernova was, is sort of the edge of this, end of this spiral arm. And so you can then, you know, say it, it should explode, of course, in the same part of the galaxy. And so we can map the, the image of one galaxy, one image of the galaxy to the other images. Um, to say exactly where they occurred. All right. So far, that's the last of the, the questions. So I, I will wait a bit to see if others appear here. I will say to my eye that that mapping that you're talking about where it's just the mirror image it's not immediately obvious to me when i look at those those two where the you know um where all the little dots line up um i, I mean i take i believe you <laughs> that you can do it because you did you know predict where it would show up and it did predict there but it's 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 a little distorted right it's stretched oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not it's not just a it's just not a flip mirror image, it's distorted yeah. mirror image, right? And, and now, and my explanation was sort of one, one, one tack one could take, but in fact, you use the model of the, the distribution of the dark matter and the matter in the cluster to figure out how much the light will be deflected. So let's take, you know, some of these images in the Einstein cross, you can figure out how much the cluster will deflect it at those points. And then we can then map that back to where it was in its original galaxy. And then we can look for images that should be formed by the cluster in different places. And those will be, uh, you know, in these two other images of the galaxy. So that's actually the way people do it. But you can check that by mapping the different knots to each other if you want. So. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. I'll wait for one more minute here. Oh, here we have one. Uh, so from Dave, could a nearby cluster as in Virgo cause this type of lensing? Uh, yeah, so you, you really need um, the right geometric distances to, to create uh, really spectacular lenses. So generally you'd want something um, that's not too far away uh, and not too close. And so Virgo is very close to us. And so it won't act as a very powerful gravitational lens. But if we move that, move it farther away from us, then you, you could start seeing these really spectacular arcs. Uh, but it's really too close for us to see that. On the other hand, if you look maybe right through the center, you could see um, you know, some highly magnified sources, but they wouldn't appear very large on the sky because the cluster is too close to us. So it's the, if I understand properly, the magnification is maximum when the distance is about the same distance on the back side of the lens as in the front side of the lens, right? Yeah, more so or less. So with Virgo being so close, another 15 megaparsecs back there, you're saying there's not so much going on, right? Yeah, and, and yeah. so- And the volume it, in which you could put things that would be high magnified is, is smaller, smaller, right? right. If you move it further away, there's a bigger yeah. volume. That's too bad. <laughs> um, I, 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 sorry, I missed one. It was a follow-up. It was, it, it, I think you already talked about it. it said, Can images be changed by large clumps of dark matter? Uh, yes, yeah. And so, and so that's actually one of the best ways to study these clump, you know, how many clumps of dark matter are out there? Uh, are they in expectation with their understanding of how dark matter acts in combination with gravity? And so, uh, in fact, in God, there's a recent paper I was just talking about today with some other people who looked at um, how some of these arcs are perturbed by clumps of dark matter in the cluster. And it turns out, this is a paper by uh, an Italian named Massimo, Massimo Minighetti. He, he found that um, there seemed to be too many of these sort of dis, um, perturbations of these long arcs uh, than you would expect given our understanding of dark matter in, in galaxy clusters. And so there's something strange, something to be explained there. Maybe we need to revise our understanding of, um, of dark matter or perhaps of, there's a problem with our simulations, but it's a, an interesting new avenue. 
And I, I think this is now a question from Brian, which I think we already talked about is, is the optimal distance halfway between us and the remote object? Uh, yeah, I think at least, yeah, some, <clears throat> something at least half. So I think if, if you keep going, uh, you know, past that, you're, you're still in, in good shape. But um, although, yeah, well, there's a sweet spot. I, yeah, I'm not, it's, not, it's something like that, yeah. All right. If there are no more questions, which I have to give people enough time to type at least, right? Sure. Uh, <laughs> if, if there are no more questions, uh, Pat, I'd like to thank you very much for this, this wonderful talk and for sharing your research and discoveries with us. Uh, we, we really do appreciate that. A lot of fun. <laughs> and I'll hand it back to Katie, who can, I guess, stop the recording. Okay. I just want to thank everyone again for attending tonight's uh, virtual webinar. Um, I, like I said in the beginning, we will be sending out um, an email the next like week or two uh, with the link so that you can share it with your friends and family. Um, I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you.